So our first speaker is Mike Sifkis, and he's joining us from the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And he's going to be talking about sea lamprey in the Great Lakes and um, talking about how they have acted as drivers of change in the Great Lakes. Okay, so um, yeah, well, thanks a lot. Thanks for inviting me to speak. Uh, and thanks to all the participants for listening to the presentation today. Um, today I'm going to introduce you to the uh, the sea lamprey as an invader of the Great Lakes. And um, I think as sort of a spoiler to the whole passengers versus drivers uh, spectrum, I think sea lamprey are probably one of the ones that fall closer to the driver side of the spectrum. And, and I think that will become pretty apparent as we go through the presentation here. Um, I always like to start off these presentations with a uh, uh, with a with a visual of the business end of a sea lamprey, and um, and we'll get into uh, their impacts to the uh, Great Lakes, especially the fisheries of the Great Lakes, and also the economy uh, in the Great Lakes after their invasion. Uh, another part of the story, though, uh, as Anne just alluded to, is that the they're not the only invasive species in the Great Lakes, and and I think it, it, it does um, warrant a little bit of exploration as to what other things, cascading ecosystem events happened in the Great Lakes after, after the sea lamprey invaded. And uh, finally, I'd be remiss too if I didn't talk a little bit about uh, how we battled the sea lamprey in the Great Lakes. And, and uh, so I'll get into a little bit of that as we go forward. So before talking about the sea lamprey invasion, uh, it's it's good to get a good look at the Great Lakes ecosystem as a whole. And I'm probably not telling anybody anything they are, don't already know, but uh, the Great Lakes is one of the world's largest freshwater ecosystems, comprising oh probably about 20% of the world's fresh water. Uh, the Great Lakes is also a relatively young ecosystem, uh, being formed by glaciation events, uh, the last of which was which occurred probably about 14,000 years ago. Uh, when you look at the ecosystem, uh, you compare this to, say, the African Great Lakes, um, which are pictured here. Uh, these have been around for hundreds of thousands of years in the case of Lake Victoria and, and, and millions of years in the, lake of, in the case of Lake Tanganyika. Uh, the reason I mention that is that the species assemblage in the Great Lakes is relatively uh, uh, relatively less complex uh, and and more simple compared to those of the Great Lakes around the world, and uh, and the species assemblages that we have in the Great Lakes in North America are, are much much less diverse than than say some of the other lakes, and this is due to just the lack of time for uh, species radiation that has occurred uh, in a relatively short period of time as, as compared to a long period of time in some of the older lakes, older Great Lakes around the world. So in the Great Lakes where species radiation hasn't had much time to function, species are relatively few, like I just said. Uh, the near shore waters are inhabited by familiar species found across a very wide geographic region in, in North America. Uh, these are comprised of like smallmouth bass and walleye, sunfish, northern pike, lake sturgeon, to name a few. But the lake uh, was also inhabited uh, and is also inhabited by a unique assembly of fish uh, that basically were in the infancy of species radiation by the time uh, humans uh, started uh, inhabiting the area. This assemblage is uh, is, is what we call the Corgonid species of the Great Lakes, and these consist of whitefish and the Cisco species flock, which is pictured here. And um, so these, these fish species generally occupied more of the deep and pelagic waters of the lake, the open waters of the lake, and were, were uh, generally separated by, uh, by those uh, unique habitats in which they, in, in which they uh, uh, lived. And uh, as we'll talk about as we go forward, these were actually part of a, a very large commercial fishery uh, back in, um, you know, the early histories of, um, of the U.S. And, uh, and Canada. And taking advantage of this species flock was a large predator and really the only uh, deep water and open, uh, well, it was one of the main deep water and open water predators in the Great Lakes, that, and that is the lake trout. <clears throat> 
And there was many morphotypes of this of lake trout uh, in these lakes uh, that occupied these different uh, uh, different areas, such as the Siskiwet lake trout on the bottom, and uh, uh, it ranging all the way up to what we call uh, a lean lake trout. The Siskiwet occupied those deeper waters. The lean lake trout is probably what everybody is most familiar with. That's the one that most fishers catch when they're out um, um, uh, fishing for lake trout uh, or salmon on on Lake Michigan, they would, if they caught a lake trout, it would probably be the lean form. So, um, with this species assembly, uh, basically, uh, once humans uh, began exploiting uh, the Great Lakes resources, uh, uh, not only the fishery, but also the natural resources in the region, um, the Native Americans were probably the first to do this uh, around 6,000 or so years ago, but their impact was very minimal on the on the area given the relatively uh, small size and population, but that all changed. Uh, the paradigm shifted once European colonization happened. Um, as you know, with you know with the building of of, of, of civilizations and cities and uh, deforestation for natural resource uh, uh, consumption, the building of dams, farms. In all the things that go along with the with with the advancement of civilization, uh, there 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 came subsequent habitat and water quality degradation in the Great Lakes. Um, also, at this time, there was increasing exploitation of the Great Lakes fish stocks, um, and this further stressed the ecosystem. And by the early 1900s, many of the fish stocks in the Great Lakes were showing signs of overharvest which was also exacerbated by the habitat loss and water quality degradation that was occurring at the same time. So um, with this over harvest and with the water quality degradations that were happening, this led you know, basically the Great Lakes to, to being a very vulnerable ecosystem to dramatic ecological changes. And, and I think uh, uh, Anne touched on that a little bit. There was some perturbations here. Um, uh, that could, or you know, that basically put it in a position to be very drastically changed. And as you likely know, the story doesn't end well for the Great Lakes in this regard, because then in comes the sea lamprey, and it's uh, uh, what is considered by uh, many Great Lakes man fisheries managers to be the proverbial straw that broke the camel's back, and uh, basically was an ecosystem game changer, but not one for the better. I'll get into there impacts uh, 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 a little bit later, but first let's let's get into how they got here. So sea lampreys are native to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they were first observed in Lake Ontario as early as 1835 and likely gained access to the lake to Lake Ontario through through the Erie Canal, which connects the Hudson River and ultimately the Atlantic Ocean. So up until that point, uh, Niagara Falls served as a natural barrier confining sea lampreys to Lake Ontario. However, in the late 1800s when the Welland Canal was built and the early 1900s when improvement to the canal uh, likely let uh, sea lampreys bypass Niagara Falls. Uh, the Welland Canal provides a shipping channel between Lakes Erie and Ontario. And this allowed sea lamprey access to the rest of the Great Lakes. And by the late 1930s or so, the invasion was complete. They were basically through, throughout all of the Great Lakes. So after the sea lamprey invasion, biologists studied the sea lamprey life cycle and, and distribution in the Great Lakes. And they noted that sea lampreys begin their life as filter feeding larvae that reside in their natal streams for anywhere from three to possibly more than 10 years. It all depends on the amount of nutrients which are in the stream in the growth rate uh, in which they experience within those streams. Once they reach a certain size, larval sea lamprey go through a dramatic metamorphosis where they develop eyes, they develop a suction cup mouth that has teeth, and um, they migrate to the lakes to feed on fish at that point. After they, after they feed uh, anywhere from um, 12 to 18 months, sea lamprey detach from their host fish they stop feeding, they find and migrate up a suitable spawning stream, they, they find a mate, reproduce, and then die. So they're, they're much like salmon in that regard, um, where they only have one reproductive life cycle, or cycle uh, before they perish. 
Biologists also found that of the 5,000 or so Great Lakes tributaries, there are about 500 uh, that have been shown to harbor sea lamprey at one point or another. And currently about 184 of those tributaries have been shown to consistently harbor sea lamprey. And that's represented here by the, uh, uh, by the map and the, and the red lines on this map are sea lamprey infested tributaries around the Great Lakes. So in the parasitic juvenile stage, sea lampreys use their large oral sucking discs um, that are filled with these teeth. And basically they, uh, they do this, uh, or they, they use that mouth to attach to a host fish. They then use their, their tongue, and, uh, which also is armed with these teeth. And uh, basically they, they, they rasp a hole through the side of the fish by, by uh, moving that tongue back and forth. And then they, uh, they ultimately uh, feed on the host's blood and body fluids after they uh, achieve a hole through the side of the fish. In the Atlantic Ocean, where sea lampreys co-evolve with their host fishes, sea lampreys act as parasites. And they rarely cause population level effects that would imperil the host fish existence. In the Great Lakes, where sea lamprey did not evolve, they basically act more as a predator. Um, where sea lampreys did not co-evolve, um, you know, with the host fish predators. Basically, sea lampreys are too large of a parasite to be able to um, uh, act as a parasite on, um, on fishes in the Great Lakes, so they act more as predators. So in the Great Lakes, a single sea lamprey can kill up to 40 pounds of fish. Fish that don't die from the initial attack often die from a secondary infection at the wound site. Sea lampreys prefer the cold and larger bodied fish like lake trout and whitefish, but they also feed on those smaller cisco species uh, that I showed you before. Uh, sea lamprey will also feed on nearshore species like walleye, northern pike, and even lake sturgeon. So after sea lampreys um, uh, uh, invaded the Great Lakes, the once thriving commercial fishery and lake trout were largely extirpated in much of the Great Lakes. So here you can see by this graph, the commercial harvest of lake trout basically went down to zero in all of the Great Lakes. The sea lamprey invasion also upset the balance of the ecosystem uh, by wiping out its top predator fish. The Cisco, Lake Herring, and whitefish populations that I showed you before were also uh, uh, deeply affected by sea lamprey, either through direct predation um, or some of the cascading events that, that happened. So in fact, the blackfin cisco, the short-nosed cisco, and the deepwater cisco represented by the X's here were all extirpated from the lakes. And there was another fish called the blue pike, a close relative of the walleye, that actually became extinct because of the sea lamprey invasion. So the ecosystem void left by vanishing lake trout and the cisco and whitefish assemblies uh, in the wake of the sea lamprey invasion allowed other invasive species to flourish. In particular, rainbow smelt and alewife. Unchecked by a top predator, smelt and alewife populations exploded, triggering periodic die-offs from disease and overpopulation. In this sense, sea lampreys were drivers of ecosystem change, and alewife and smelt passengers uh, were basically passengers that came along with the sea lamprey, taking advantage of the changed ecological conditions uh, left by the sea lamprey invasion. So with the loss of the fishery went a major source of livelihood for thousands of people whose jobs related directly to the fishery, such as fish, uh, commercial fishermen, boat captains, and uh, fish processors, etc. And uh, basically some of the indirect uh, uh, businesses associated with fishing and tourism, such as marine owners and operators and, and um, hotels and restaurants, were also deeply affected by uh, by the change in, changes in the ecosystem that occurred because of sea lamprey. And they relied on this, uh, you know, this healthy economy generated uh, by the Great Lakes ecosystem. So in addition to all these things that were happening, the property values along the lakeshore plummeted because of the, uh, basically the rotting masses of dead alewife and smelt that were washing up on beaches. So both the economy, the land values, and uh, all the associated other industries and businesses with this were in pretty dire conditions by, by the 1950s.
So now to get into a little bit about what we did, you know, basically to, uh, to, to help this situation is fishery management agencies and governments realized that they had a pretty daunting task ahead of them here. So they needed to coordinate fisheries management among uh, two countries, uh, eight states, uh, one province, and several tribal entities. And they needed they, they knew they needed to do this to, to battle the sea lamprey and to restore uh, the ecosystem and the fish communities of the Great Lakes. And they knew this was not going to be a small feat because, in fact, prior to this, there was about 40 attempts to create some sort of mechanism for cross-border fishery management. Um, and all of these had failed up until this point. And really, this was, the game changer here was the sea lamprey invasion. The states, the province, and the tribes knew this problem was too big for any one authority to manage, and they knew they needed federal resources to help. So a solution was reached by the governments of Canada and the United States through the Convention on Great Lakes Fisheries, and it established the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in 1955. The commission is charged with basically three major duties, to coordinate fishery management and fishery research, and to develop, oversee, and conduct um, a sea lamprey control program. And over the years, a successful control program was developed. And basically, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission delivers this in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the DFO um, in Canada, the Army Corps of Engineers, and the U.S. Geological Survey. And it uses an integrated approach that uses both lamprecides uh, or selective pesticides that target larval sea lampreys in their natal streams, barriers to block uh, sea lamprey access to productive spawning and larval habitat, and traps that capture and remove upstream migrating adults from the spawning population, but also that capture those downstream migrating parasitic juveniles before they can reach the lake and do damage to fish. I won't get into any more on, on sea lamprey control. Uh, that's really a talk for another day. But let's talk about impacts of sea lamprey control, though. This graph shows um, uh, many different shows of many different data sets here. Um, basically, the red line is, is sea lamprey abundance, and the the shaded blue is lake trout abundance. The orange yellow lines depict when sea lampreys were first discovered, and also when sea lamprey control was first initiated in the late 1950s. Sea lamprey populations rapidly spiked. Uh, to well over a million individuals. And after the first application of sea lamprey control, uh, you can see a corresponding reduction in sea lamprey numbers down to about 10% of the peak abundance. And then you see also a rapid recovery of uh, lake trout populations denoted by that shaded blue. And continued sea lamprey control has, has kept sea lamprey numbers in check basically since the 1950s. And we need to apply this on a yearly basis to have that effect. So to look at it another way, this graph shows the effect of sea lamprey control and pounds of fish saved. We basically went from 100 million pounds of fish loss per year to sea lamprey down to about 10 million pounds today. I mean, that's a huge reduction, but we still lose far too many fish uh, to sea lamprey. So we, we, still need to, we still have improvements we can do in sea lamprey control. But it is a good success. And basically what has happened is that um, since its inception, um, uh, sea lamprey control has been able to take it from uh, the ecosystem of the Great Lakes to one that was very much in peril, uh, basically to one that, that is currently thriving. And uh, basically today, the, the fishery and tourism industry is worth a, 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 you know, a, a fairly substantial amount in $7 billion. And it protects uh, tens of thousands of jobs basically are are, are, are dedicated to this industry, and it's the backbone of many local communities. But enough said about the plug, you know, about sea lamprey control and what it does. Let's get back to passengers and drivers and kind of review where we've been. So sea lamprey uh, function as drivers causing ecological changes that influence other ecosystem processes. So we've talked about that. We've talked about how alewife and smelt function basically as passengers in the wake of the sea lamprey disturbance that has happened on the Great Lakes. So these voids left by sea lamprey uh, and predation on native fish have allowed them to come in. 
But what we, what we haven't talked about yet is how alewife and smelt could also be considered drivers of ecosystem change. And here it is, you know, we're kind of moving along that spectrum that Ann brought up. So I'll briefly talk about that a little bit just to wrap up this talk and open it up for any questions here at the end. So alewife and smelt act as drivers, or they can act as drivers, or maybe they're maintaining the ecological change in the Great Lakes. Um, like Ann says, it gets a little complicated. But they, they also suppress lake trout populations. So they can do this through direct predation on lake trout fry. So alewife occupy the same areas where lake trout eggs are, are basically hatching. And they can have devastating impacts on, on lake trout fry in natural reproduction in natural reproduction situations. But probably more importantly though, uh, they affect lake trout populations through a more complex physiological process. So basically how this works is adult sea lamprey or adult lake trout eat alewife and smelt. However, alewife and smelt have high levels of thymonase. And this is this enzyme basically functions to break down thiamine. So what does this do? Well, thiaminase causes thiamine deficiency in adult lake trout. So therefore, an adult female lake trout that has fed primarily on alewife and smelt will have low levels of thiamine in her eggs. The thiamine deficiency is then passed along to her offspring, and because young lake trout rely on the yolk sac during the early part of their lives and can't get thiamine from other sources, the young lake trout die. This ultimately leads to the suppression of lake trout populations, driving ecological changes by suppressing the top predator. So this isn't too much, it's not dissimilar as to what's happening when sea lampreys are preying on, on lake trout as well. So the evidence of the impacts of alewife and smelt on lake trout populations is pretty clear in Lake Huron. Um, if any of you are familiar with that, you know that alewife and smelt populations have crashed to near zero uh, in that lake, which happened in, happened in the early 2000s. Since then, wild and naturally reproduced lake trout have exploded in Lake Huron, and the need for lake trout stocking has been drastically diminished. It appears the same results are happening in Lake Michigan, where alewife and smelt populations are in steep decline right now. And I guess I'll just, um, I, I think that's probably where I'll end it for today. Um, the, the Great Lakes are actually a, uh, 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 probably a good example of, of, of many different species of invasive species affecting others. I mean, we could talk about uh, zebra mussels and quagga mussels and how they've driven ecosystem change as well. Um, one uh, non-invasive species but non-native that also is a driver of ecosystem processes is probably the introduction of Pacific salmon, Chinook salmon and uh, uh, coho salmon and uh, steelhead and obviously they were brought in to uh, take care of some of the overpopulations of smelt and alewife so we, we could uh, we could easily talk about how those are ecosystem drivers as well but again those are probably stories for another day and I guess with that I can end it with uh, any questions that anybody may have